We spent the last several days in the final book of our English Old Testament, the book of Malachi. And I've been using my own personal translation of this, and you can find a copy of that translation on the website, intotheword.net. Then look in the Old Testament section for the book of Malachi, and then there'll be a hyperlink uh, for the translation itself. We are talking right now about this idea that it seems like the bad people, the sinners, get away with stuff. So what good does it do for us to refrain from sinful practices? And uh, that's an age-old issue. It's being brought up here in the book of Malachi. And God's response is effectively because you need to be thinking of this on a larger scale. Not just about life here and now in this short period of mortality, but you need to think about eternity itself. So with that in mind, let's uh, reread starting at Malachi chapter 3, no, chapter yeah, chapter 3, verse 14, and then push forward into the last section of the book of Malachi today. So Malachi 3.14 says, You have said it's worthless to serve God. What profit is there for our keeping his ordinances or for our walking mournfully before the face of he who is over the armies? From now on, we're calling the arrogant blessed. See, the person is portrayed here, making the argument, you know what, the sinners are more blessed than we are because they get away with stuff. Indeed, those doing evil are built up. Indeed, they put God to the test and escape. So this is the age-old problem of sin is not always punished instantly uh, and proportionally. It almost seems sometimes that the bad people get away with everything, but it's not always true, and it definitely won't be true in eternity. Because listen to this next part, verse 16, these things were spoken by those fearing he who is, each to the rest, he who is listened and heard. A memorial scroll scroll was written before his face on behalf of those who fear he who is and who consider his name. They will be mine, says he who is over the armies, on that day in which I make a treasure, the Hebrew word is segula, and I will spare them as a man spare his son who serves him. So the Jewish people had been told at the very beginning of their history, if they would embrace God as their God, he would embrace them as his most treasured possession, his segula his own people. And so that promise remains in place through the Old Covenant into the New Covenant. Uh, We just need to understand it's a matter of eternity. We can't be focused on just a tiny little piece of time that is uh, represented by our own lives. We've got to think about what's yet in, in the future. Uh, Verse number 18, you will be turned and you will see the difference between righteous and wicked, between the one serving God and the one not serving God. Now, when will we see that distinction most clear? And the answer is at the second coming of Jesus and at the various judgments that follow after the second coming of Jesus. It will be obvious who belong to him because they'll be spending eternity in his rest and those who don't belong to him who will be spending eternity away from his presence in a place that's variously referred to as hell, the pit, the abyss, the lake of fire, Uh, the place of darkness, all of these descriptions of what it must be like to spend eternity away from God's eternal presence. And so we have here the description of what's uh, termed a lot of places as the day of the Lord. That is the day of God's judgment between the righteous and the unrighteous. So chapter 4 
of the book of Malachi, verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and it shall be that all the arrogant and all the evildoers are like chaff. That is, the stuff that's going to be thrown into the fire. Uh, Chaff is the junk that's left over from harvest. It has no nutritional value. It has no value of use other than something to uh, keep the fire going. And so this is the way that eternal judgment is often described. Uh, The coming day will burst into flames upon them, says he who is over the armies, and will leave them neither root nor branch. In the New Testament, in the Gospels, when John the Immerser comes on the scene as the messenger Uh, that's in chapter 3 of this particular book we're looking at here. He warns the people that the day of the Lord is coming, and it is burning, and the axe is already laid at the root of the trees, and every dead branch is going to be gathered up and thrown into the fire that is not able to be quenched. And so he picks up on this fiery judgment scene in his ministry, and he calls people to repent because he doesn't want them to to be burned uh, in eternal fire. John wants them to turn around and embrace God and spend an eternity with him, and that's the same attitude that all of us New Testament believers have to have as well. We should not take joy and pleasure in the idea of people going to hell That should make our stomachs turn. It should make us upset. Uh, We should preach to people, teach people about the coming judgment, not because we're happy, but because we're devastated by the idea that they might end up there. And we have the answer for where they don't have to end up in that uh, rejection from the presence of God. And so that's what John's message was. That's what our message should be, because it's the God thing. Uh, God says in Ezekiel chapter 18, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but would rather have them come to repentance. So that's the goal. And so because of that, the next thing in the book of Malachi looks toward those that have repented and who will spend eternity in his presence. And I love the the imagery here. Verse 2 of chapter 4. But it shall rise upon you, that is the day of the Lord, the the final three and a half years is really what we're talking about here, Uh, the time right before Jesus comes back, and it actually climaxes with him coming back. It shall rise upon you who fear my name as a son of righteousness, and healing shall be in its wings. Now, you have to get the imagery of the sun here. When you get up early, which everybody's been up early at some point, I'm sure, and you look off to the east on a nice clear day, and suddenly you start seeing a lightning of the horizon, And you know that the reason it's happening is because the sun is going to be up soon. And then often the environment is just perfect. The atmosphere is just perfect that you start seeing these little beams of light start shooting up into the sky from that lighted horizon. And then soon the sun explodes above the horizon. So that's the image that we're supposed to be getting here in this passage. Only it's not the literal sun, it's the sun of righteousness. And the picture is Jesus. That Jesus explodes onto the scene, uh, bringing healing in his wings. Because we've got the ultimate healing that's coming, which is a new body. The old body is either dead and buried and will be resurrected in the new body, or the body that we're in when Jesus comes and we're alive, uh, it's going to be transformed in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye. And so 
this healing of these mortal bodies where we become immortals explodes on the scene with the coming of Jesus. Now, I want to let you know that I think this contributed to some of the misunderstanding around um, Christmas, uh, because there is this, this accusation that December 25th, which, by the way, is not the accurate date for the birth of Jesus. It's actually the opposite side of the calendar from that, and it was because of mistakes in misunderstandings of Jewish calendars that led to this. Uh, that's a whole other topic that I'll go over uh, whenever we get to the Gospels, perhaps. Uh, but there's this accusation that December 25th was the birthday of the sun. It was a pagan holiday, and the uh, Christians uh, inappropriately grabbed a hold of it and uh, turned it into a celebration of Jesus' birth. That is not the way it happened at all. This is the way it happened. We know that the first Christian Roman emperor was a guy by the name of Constantine. And uh, by the time Constantine came on the scene, uh, the mistake about the calendar had already happened, that Christians had already been in the Roman Empire, the Western Roman Empire, uh, celebrating Jesus' birth date on the 25th day of December on the Roman calendar. Well, when Constantine uh, became a believer, uh, he uh, took that date as the, the authentic date for Jesus' birth. But he was also aware of this passage, which was a favorite of the ancient church. And so he pictured, like many Christians did, Jesus being that rising of the sun. And so he took um, the soul invictus idea that the Romans did have, that the, the sun is inconquerable or unconquerable. And he just simply said, you know, let's celebrate the rising of the sun, Jesus. Uh, and he even put it on his coinage uh, about the rising of the sun. Sol Invictus. And so that's all because uh, he was aware of this passage here prophetically. And so uh, those of you that I know have gotten into this negative mindset of hating December 25th, please just knock it off. Uh, you're, you're functioning on some misunderstandings uh, that were not appropriate. Uh, and instead, we need to embrace the passages that do show Jesus being the rising of the sun. Uh, and so this is, the, this is the way that the passage also describes those of us uh, that are going to be there on that day that Jesus comes in blinding glory and resurrects us from the dead. It says, you shall go out and you shall skip like a calf from a stall. Now, I was raised in a rural environment. I spent some of my younger years actually living on a working farm. And one of the things that was always a joy to see was the young calves playing. Because all of a sudden, they just bolt uh, out into the field, running as fast as they could, and they'd be jumping around all over the place just because they were happy with life. Well, <laughs> this is written in an agricultural husband's husbandry society where they also were familiar with that image. And so the joy on that day of Jesus returning is going to be like the joy of a young calf suddenly exploding out into the pasture and we'll be dancing around and celebrating greatly. And I look forward to that because I'll also have my new body uh, to do that dancing and celebrating in. Now, verse 3 gets back to the context of judgment. And it says, You will trample the wicked, for they shall be like ashes under the soles of your feet on the day I'm making, says he who is over the armies. Now, we know that the day of the Lord comes with judgment against those that took the mark of the beast 
and ultimately we get to the Battle of Armageddon, and everybody that has taken that mark ends up dying at the coming of Jesus' judgment, which is described as being in fire. And so those folks are going to be nothing but ashes left. And so that's the imagery uh, that comes forward here into this passage. Now, before all of that happens, God sends a warning messenger. Uh, Now, this is what it says, and I'm following the uh, numbering of the Greek Old Testament at this point. Uh, Verse number five, Behold, I am sending you Elijah the Tishbite before the coming day of he who is the great and fearful one. He will turn the hearts of the fathers toward the children and the hearts of the children toward the fathers, lest I come and strike the land with absolute destruction or with the curse that brings absolute destruction. Now, we know that this passage is quoted in the New Testament Gospels about John the Immerser, that he is the messenger that comes ahead of Jesus and tells people, that they need to prepare for the coming day of judgment by repenting. That he's the one that keeps turning the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the children back to the fathers uh, ahead of that judgment day. Uh, When Luke records the words of the angel Gabriel at the uh, meeting with John's father, Zechariah, Uh, He is told that his son is going to go forward in the spirit and power of Elijah, specifically that name. This is, uh, let's see, it's Luke, uh, make sure I got the right passage here, Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 76, so you can go and look it for yourself. So there is zero doubt that... uh, John the Immerser fulfills this passage in his ministry because he's in the spirit and power of Elijah. Uh, Jesus, uh, after the transfiguration, he tells the apostles uh, effectively that John was the Elijah that was to come. So there is a metaphorical fulfillment of this passage here, a symbolic fulfillment of this passage Uh, with John the Immerser being the coming of Elijah the Tishbite uh, before the day of the Lord arrives. Now, with that said very clearly, I want to also throw out there uh, that I believe that what the rabbis, the Jewish people, were expecting about the return of Elijah the Tishbite is likely to happen before the second coming of Jesus. Because remember, there's two comings. Jesus came the first time, and John the Immerser was his forerunner. He will be back another time, uh, book of Revelation chapter number 19, but he will be preceded by two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11. We know that. And I am convinced, along with many, many other students of the Bible, that one of those witnesses will be the literal Elijah the Tishbite. Now, what happened to Elijah? Well, he was a prophet of God uh, during the time of the kings, specifically King Ahab. And at the end of his earthly ministry of that period, he was caught up in a whirlwind and a chariot of fire and taken up into heaven into the sky and disappeared. He did not die. I am convinced that he was pulled forward in time, past our time period, into the day of the Lord, the final three and a half year period, and that he will be one of the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11. Now, what happens to those witnesses? They are killed at the end of their ministry. Uh, They testify for 1,260 days. That is 10 days short of three and a half years on a Jewish calendar. 
And so they will be killed. And then three and a half days later, they will resurrect from the dead at God's command and be taken up into heaven. And that will only leave seven days in the three and a half year period left. So seven days until the second coming of Jesus. Uh, So I believe all of this kind of falls together where Jesus has two comings, uh, the first time to deal with sin, the second time to deal with sinners. Uh, And there will be two Elijahs. The first one was John the Immerser. The second one, I think, will be Elijah the Tishbite, uh, exactly as uh, the Jewish people had kind of anticipated uh, all along. Uh, Now, even modern Jews... Uh, kind of anticipate that the Messiah will be introduced to them by Elijah. Uh, Some of them even hold the tradition uh, that they set a a special setting, a place setting, uh, at their festival tables uh, for Elijah to um, be able to use when he shows up. Uh, And some of them will even leave their doors open on these special occasions so that when Elijah arrives, he can come right on in. He doesn't have to knock. And so I, um, I fully expect that many, many, many ethnic Jews will be evangelized uh, by Elijah the prophet uh, in that final three and a half year period. Now, I know immediately some of you are going, well, who's the other guy? Is it Moses? And I'm like, well, Moses is certainly a candidate. And many, many uh, Bible students, many scholars Uh, suggests that Moses and Elijah will be the two prophets uh, in uh, Revelation chapter 11 during that final three and a half year period. And and they will uh, usually say the reason they think it's Moses is because many of the plagues are very much like the plagues that Moses was orchestrating uh, whenever he was serving the Lord. Uh, But my candidate is the only other guy that didn't die in Old Testament stories. And that would be Enoch, uh, the man who, after 365 years of life, walked with God and was no more because God took him. And so uh, I believe Enoch and Elijah will be the two witnesses. Uh, And that Enoch is unique uh, to this because we know he is quoted in the book of Jude, that he actually saw the day of the Lord, uh, that he saw uh, the Lord coming with myriads and myriads, tens thousands and ten thousands of his saints, uh, in order to bring judgment against the unrighteous. Uh, That's in the book of Jude. Uh, So I think uh, it makes good logical sense that the only two guys that didn't die in the Old Testament stories are the ones that will then die in the ultimate Old Test- or New Testament story, book of Revelation, chapter number 11, as the two witnesses preparing for the second coming of Jesus, the Messiah. Uh, and even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Now, in the... Um, Greek Old Testament, uh, the last line of the book of Malachi is this, remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I laid upon him in Horeb for all Israel, ordinances and decisions. Now in the Masoretic text from the medieval period, that verse comes two verses earlier. And so that's why it comes in most of our English Bibles, uh, a little bit earlier in the book. Uh, But the reason I think it does fit at the tail end here is that this book is intended to call the people reading it to remember the law of Moses, to do the things that they'd committed to do. Uh, Because as I shared with you, I think this book was probably generated right around the time of Nehemiah, when the people had already made a written recommitment to keep the law, but had then fallen away from it uh, during those years that, Eli- uh, that, uh, excuse me, that uh, Nehemiah was gone, 
uh, and uh, they needed to repent of that falling off of their commitment. We've got about two minutes left, so let me set the stage for next week and next session. Uh, And it is related to this idea that Nehemiah served as governor the first time for about a dozen years. And then he went back to Persia for an unknown period of time, perhaps months, but more likely for a few years. And then he returned again to function as governor a second time. And when he came back, he found out that the people had abandoned their commitment to the covenant in such a short period of time. It was shocking. And so he ends up having to correct all that. And the high priest Eliashib was complicit in this falling off. Because as we will discover, shortly after Nehemiah left, Eliashib the priest allowed Tobiah the Ammonite, a non-Israeli, but someone that was related to him by marriage, to move into the storage rooms surrounding the temple shrine building, places that were supposed to be used for the tithe and for the uh, oil and the grain that was used in the worship ceremonies. Uh, So he actually makes an apartment for a non-believer and a non-Israeli in the storage rooms around the temple building. And that is absolutely unacceptable. And when Nehemiah gets back and he finds that that's the case, uh, the first thing he does is he goes in there and starts throwing all that junk out of the temple. And then he starts calling the people to repentance.